So Thomas Adams, the American assigned to aid Lopez de Santa Ana while he was in the U.S., experimented with chicle in an attempt to use it as a substitute for rubber. He bought one ton of the substance from Lopez de Santa Ana, but his experiments proved unsuccessful. Instead, Adams helped to found the chewing gum industry with a product he called Chicklets. Oh, wow. And I think Wrigley ended up sort of taking over that. It was a shakedown. Aha. Uh-huh. Interesting. We always learn something new every time Dr. Future is on Conspiracy Normal. Well, that'll be the peak of it. Right. There yeah, it goes downhill be, from here. <laughs> that'll be the peak of it. We So welcome everybody to Conspiracy Normal. It's uh the end of the year episode, although we do still have I believe we're gonna do our year in review at some point. Um probably next week, but we've you know, we have a tradition on this show. Tradition is very important. Tradition is very important. And we do this every single year. We have one individual that is uh, very important to this show, and that's Dr. Future. And I was going to I was gonna say that important person couldn't make it, so we called Mike Bennett, <laughs> and he showed up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's, he's filling us in with all kind of wisdom tonight already uh, in the 15 minutes that we've been talking. The mysterious origins of chewing gum. Yeah, the mysterious origins of chewing gum. and That was definitely Patreon material. It's not for the common folk to know. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that's for true. the that's, elite of conspiranormalism. That's, that's for the elite. But every year we like to finish up and look at the last year and talk about where we are going to go in the next year and you know really what i should do is listen to last year's episode and take notes but i didn't do that but uh, and then compare where we are so but i'm sure there's somebody out there just listened to every conspiracy normal dr future end of the year episode and, and said well dr future's just wrong he did what he's talking about but but i'm pretty sure that everything we've talked about has been uh pretty much has come true but so, just because his name is Dr. Future does not mean he's a psychic. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I thought it would help me know the future, but it didn't work that way. But all you people out there, if you are saying, well, Dr. Future is wrong, blah, 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 just save your time emailing me because I get enough of that under my roof every day anyway. So <laughs> I'm told I'm wrong all the time. So, yeah, I say, yes, Mrs. Future. <laughs> well, Dr. Future, this is going to be real loose like we did last week. Um, we're just going to talk about some of the things that, you know, it's kind of been on our minds that we probably haven't been able to talk about too much. And, but I think to kind of really start out, I want to talk some about uh, this incident that occurred, I think it was last month or maybe earlier this month. Hey, hey before Nor- you start this. Yeah. Could, couldn't we actually, instead of seeing this as the end of the year, isn't this a foreshadowing of the new year? It's a little bit of both. To be more positive. I was yeah. just going to start it out by singing, we've only just begun to live white lace and promises. Kiss for luck and we're on our way. And yet we've just begun. Thank you, Dr. We're going to get hit for a copyright infringement. <laughs> I don't was, think I did enough bars to qualify that was, for that, that. That was amazing. Is that on the k Hits record or something? Yeah, it's sung by the sound effects. By the sound effects, yeah. I think yeah. we talked about that last year. <laughs> yeah. The, the sound effects. <laughs> yeah, the, the cheap knockoffs of the real artist. <laughs> right. Which is probably the best corollary for me there is. I'm the sound effects version of the conspiracy normal guest. No, whatever. <laughs> it's like, oh, we wanted a real guest this week. Oh, we got him. So, whenever you actually bought that album, were you disappointed that it wasn't the real artist, or was there? Everybody was, was like- disappointed. That was like the biggest <laughs> shame of the 20th century. I mean, when people would get that because it was always in fine print on the commercial, yes, that- the sound effects. 
<laughs> yes, that was the worst thing that ever happened in the 20th century. In the 20th century. <laughs> Not two world wars or the Cold War. No. <laughs> no. It was a collective trauma on all of America. When you got your album at home and you couldn't really hear Steely Dan or Fleetwood Mac, it was the sound effects. <laughs> so... So the sound effects members are probably somewhere out there, but they're in hiding because they they're in they're hiding. The, they're the most hated members of any Witness any protection. knockoff group. <laughs> Have you traced the the money of the sound effects? Was it used to fund some guerrilla group somewhere? Well, Ron Pulpeel. Somebody needs to pat him down. He's the mastermind. Oh, Ron Pulpeel was behind that. Oh yeah, yeah. K Tell, yeah. The originator of the pocket fisherman. How far does this conspiracy go? Well, I know he's he. I, I think I know he may have just died, but he looked like he was like deeply roasted, like uh, H Hamilton, you know, the actor. But he uh, he was what? selling bar. <laughs> he was selling chicken rotisseries on infomercials just the other day. Rod Popeil. Yeah. What was he doing it from beyond the grave? Well, I don't remember when he died, but they still run the commercials. I mean, he's got selling in his blood. He's like, yeah. I mean, really, he's like the robber baron of the 20th century. Do you have any of his records, Sophia? <laughs> Probably. The robber baron of the 21st century. He is. Mike, I, I really want to thank you for derailing this right off. <laughs> well, I wanted to talk about the important stuff first. Yeah. <laughs> That is the important stuff right there. Trying to raise the intellectual level of conspiracy normal a little bit. I think uh, Sir Phil is looking up Rob Popel to see if he is indeed still alive or not. If he is, he must be incredibly ancient. He died last year. He died last year. Well, that's what they want you to believe. Oh, is he somewhere like with like JFK and Elvis and Tupac on an island or something? Well, he's a pretty powerful guy. Indeed. Indeed. Well, what I kind of wanted to start off talking about is these um, these like power station uh, attacks that have been going on. You know, you and I were talking about this not too long ago, and there there's been there's been the main one that was in was it Mooresville, North Carolina, and then there's was a, there was another one that was in uh, I think somewhere around Portland and there was a third one somewhere else i think both of those the, the other two were on the west coast kind of like um copycats I, I suppose um but you know the reason that i'm kind of bringing this up is i have this is something that unlike some of the right-wing media that i've heard for a long time of people like actually talking about doing this type of thing and there was also this added element with the North Carolina one, which, you know, took out the power for like a few days. I think, I think it's been restored now, but I mean, it was, you know, it was pretty effective in doing what it People did. People were in danger. People yeah, you know, right. were really freezing. Right, right. Yeah, it took out the power to the whole county. I think Moore County, North Carolina, Mooresville, I think is where, where this was. But um, five more power station substations in Oregon and Washington have reported attacks to the FBI in the wake of the attacks on two substations in North Carolina, is what this says. And so, like, I think these are kind of like copycat. Um, but, you know, much like what happened earlier in the year, in the middle of the year, with the Georgia Guidestones being destroyed no one has any idea what happened who pulled this off and as far as i know i, I haven't seen any, any reports of like where they showed any car speeding off at least in the georgia guidestones thing there was a car that sped off from the scene they haven't matched up any kind of plates or or anything or found the car or found that person and that's been months now yeah this has only been i think in the last couple of weeks but it's like, you know, so was, there's that element there that like nobody knows who did it. And then there was another element with the power, this, the one in North Carolina, this power station attack that, you know, people were, were, were jumping to this conclusion that this had something to do with a, a, a drag queen show 
for kids in that town. And the only thing that I could really see about that was there was a woman that apparently posted on Facebook, uh, I guess using her battery because there's no power, but she posted on Facebook and said, look, I know why the substation got attacked. She was some well-known activist. Yeah. And, and she was well-known and yeah, she was actually, she's actually with somebody that was at the rally in, in January 6, 2000 in, in 2021. Um, so she was somebody that had been watched and the police actually did visit her and said, asked her if she had any information. Well, all she said was that she knew what she said was, well, it was, you know, it was God that did it. It wasn't, you know, because of, because of the wickedness of this drag queen show or whatever. So I think a lot of people on Twitter, I've saw a lot of people jump to conclusions on Twitter about this, but why not just cut power to the building? So that doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense to me, but I guess people were thinking that, you know, people have been radicalized by like, this is something we've not talked about on the show, but you know, this whole like drag queen story hour stuff that's been happening and how it's been really fueling a lot of right wing backlash. Just, you know, Mike, I just really wanted to get you like your thoughts on that. You know, who you think Mike could be behind this? Is this going to keep going on? Is this going to keep happening? And like, this definitely is going to be something that's going to like affect, it could affect us in 2023. But just to add, like, I have heard this before. Well, and there's, I've heard people talk about this to say that yeah. the, the, there are plans to attack power substations, infrastructure, targeting infrastructure. Yeah. And the, I think all these FBI alerts have been coming out for the last couple of years, basically about this exact kind of thing. You, you know, it's sad that. If they're going to go to all the effort to do that, it's a shame that they don't attack our critical electronics with panache like they do in Nashville. You know, before before it goes off, at least you hear here when you're alone and life is making you lonely, you can always go downtown. Yeah, you know, I didn't even think about that connection, but yeah, that's I mean, that did a, that affected the infrastructure for like what? Like it was like a week. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, for communications for and stuff communications, like that. Not power, yeah. Right, right. So, and we still don't really know that story. Well, supposedly somebody was running away from the van or policeman or whatever like that, trying to get everybody away. But um, I, I got a question for you all: Are those the taking out of power stations? Is that anywhere remotely mentioned in the Turner Diaries? Oh, I'm sure it probably is. I <laughs> I haven't read it, um, but yeah. You know. Because I have been told, I, I don't know if I have a PDF somewhere or not, I don't know, but um, I've been told that something like the attack, the aborted attack on the Capitol was in the Turner Diaries as something that was the catalyst for that movement in that story. I'd have to verify that, but I just wondered about the power thing because, you know, nobody has stood up and taken credit for it mm -hmm. on what it is. So... You know, if I had to bet on it, this is a wild stab. I think they saw the stuff that's going on in Ukraine and how that was such a weak link for that nation. And some people who really wanted to get some attention and shake up things here thought, huh, wonder if that would work here. And so I wouldn't be shocked if it was if they were like experiments. Like, yeah. is this feasible to do? Unfortunately, that's out there now, too, in the public consciousness that that works. So. Right, right. Uh, now, there might be some hardening of areas around there, you know, because I don't know if this was uh, like a vehicle bomb. I mean, I don't know if you all know. Do you know? They the said they believe that it is just uh, firearms. Yeah, they shot at it. Yeah, that's what I oh. understood. Yeah. Well, that's pretty pitiful if that's all it takes to take out our Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Know, exactly. Our stuff. But... Um, you know, without them taking credit, could have been just a G whiz thing and then copycats after the first one. But it, you know, if it was anything remotely organized, I would say they probably did as an experiment to see if it caused such a tizzy here as what it does in Ukraine. Um, because what, I mean, this is sort of the message that's come out of the Ukraine thing is that our energy infrastructure is a weak link. You know, yeah, it, it, it was in Iraq. Do you remember them bombing the pipelines? Mm -hmm. Now, that wasn't just a pipe just to get the energy to them, but also that was their economic export money. 
So, you know, I had even proposed some stuff on one of my inventions, which there was some interest in, in the government over there in protecting the pipelines to keep them from blowing up. Right. But, um, so, you know, that would be my guess until they come up with some leads is that it could have been just some good old boys just like, Hey, watch this. Uh, if it was really just, you know, small arms, uh, and then you had some copycats because, you know, even the one that we had here in Nashville, we had a copycat, that guy in Lebanon that was yeah, playing was the music that. like that yeah. and targeting mm -hmm. churches and things. And so that's, you know, I, I don't mean the most, say, say the most harmless, but the least concerning, but, um, or it's an experiment of something to see how we respond. I mean, it's a little hard to target planes or anything like that. That used to get a lot of people's attention when a plane went down. That's a lot harder, but from what they saw in Ukraine, this is a pretty simple thing. And that certainly gets everybody's attention when everybody's lights goes out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thankfully, it's not a good way to really get support. So I don't see it really, uh, yeah. you know, maybe. Unless uh, it's capitulation. I mean, yeah, you don't endear people with that. Yeah. Any but more than like, Russia endears the Ukrainian. Really extreme, apocalyptic racist types like who'd be inspired by stuff like turner diaries or siege yeah you know i could see them wanting to do it because they just want to bring chaos but if you've got any kind of agenda where you're trying to get popular support for your cause it's not really the way to do it cutting off grandma's power you know well now most of those folks are all off the grid that are you know that community you're talking to me about so it's no skin off their nose right and they might think we'd be extra weak and that it would be a catalyst for everybody taking well, on each other. That it know, could trigger uh, unrest in the country because of that. It affected a like a whole entire community, like the whole county, and then in a mostly rural part of North Carolina. So, like you know, I thought those are the people that they're supposed to be, you know, kind of, you know, trying to trying to help. Are, are the, the, those the people you support? So it just kind of seems counterproductive to me. Well, unless it was like I said, some just good old boys having fun, or they just wanted to do an experiment on a really small scale to watch to see what happened. I mean, it's like, remember when the FBI shot that LSD in the air in that little community in France, that little village? Mm -hmm. And then they all started going absolutely incredible you know, insane and her hurting themselves and jumping out of windows. And then they thought, well, it's probably the ergot in the rye bread. You know, you want to pick somewhere off the beaten path. If you're just right. studying cause and effect, because if you did it in New York city, there'd be a camera on every pole. Yeah. So, I mean, you got to pick s somewhere a little bit, slightly backwater to, Although it could be the fact that Mooresville was the home of Dale Earnhardt, so there may be a connection there. Might be some NASCAR beef. It very well could have been. What do you think about the... Do you think that it was because of the drag queen show that that's what they were deliberately targeting? Or do you think people just like hopped on that because that's, that's part of the wider culture war right now? Well, you'd think they'd taken credit for it if it was. Right. I think um, that probably was just the personal views of that woman who it sounded like to me, that's probably what she was fixated on the time. And she got some validation by seeing a coincidence happen. You well, know, see, I would say that's more likely. I heard this over and over from the other side that that's what it was about. It was about the drag queen. Almost immediate. Yeah. 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 Well, that's certainly a way to fix drag queens is to take out power systems i can see the immediate you know solution to that yeah because who uses more power than drag queens you know that's true. i mean almost our grid is completely dependent <laughs> you know upon yeah. supporting their needs well you know this is a wider part of a lot of what we this is a smaller part of a wider thing right so we've seen in this year you know we saw the whole like uh, the, the whole Disney thing in Florida, uh, you know, using a lot, a lot of free use of the word groomer and these type of, uh, these type of words, um, like, like 
culturally, there's like a lot of uh, there's a lot of they're coming for your children stuff that's going on, and 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 you know we've talked about before just kind of personally that some of these like like with the drag queen stuff and all this like I really feel like some of those issues are really this way for like the alt right or the right to kind of kind of bite and hold like that's kind of like your a lot of some people's entry point mm -hmm. is when they see children threatened by this community it, 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 it sends reasonable people straight into the arms of really kind of the more right wing stuff it's really what's at the heart of the whole QAnon thing yeah and if you take it farther back this is all just the old clan message this is everything that the clan said is the barbarian is at the gate and they're coming to rape our white women. Mm -hmm. And now all they've just said is like, hmm, what would be more crucial to us than our white women? Our children. They're coming to get our children. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you see this whole pedophile accusation just thrown around like it's nothing. Right. Because that's the ultimate thing you could accuse somebody of that will absolutely enrage people where they're no longer rational human beings. Yeah, it circumvents all that. It's just pure emotion, pretty much. Right. Now, are there pedophiles? Yes. Are there dangerous people? Yes. And they should be addressed. But now, you say something that you disagree with somebody else, well, then you're a pedophile. And um, once we do that so flippantly without evidence or you know something else like that, we've crossed a line right now. I mean, it, it used to be... Like I say, you you could just show a, a black man's picture, and that was enough to terrify people while they're coming to get our families. Well, that doesn't work so well anymore. So then they had to go, you know, of course, the socialist thing has been what they've been using or, you know, these kind of things. Well, now it's been reduced to this. And the line blurs because even with the John Birch Society, you know, they communists were their main thing. Well, they were able to intertwine that with the civil rights movement by saying, well, that's all being run by the communists. So they could kill two birds with one stone, mm -hmm. you know, because most of them guys are outright racist too. So if, if you tie them, then, then that's a, a double, you get a double rather than a single base hit, you know? And I think now what you do is you tie the socialist left, with the pedophile QAnon stuff and you know i can remember way way back like in the late 90s when fox news came on and watching that anytime nancy pelosi was mentioned they would always show drag queen parades in san francisco that was always the b-roll mm. and i think there was one shot um who's the other woman who was a senator she's an older woman Barbara there boxer no, there's another one. Um, Maxine Waters? No, she's a senator. Um, she's on the like military committees, um, but they're, they've they pressured her to get to leave. Um, I can't think of her name. Another woman in California. But um, they had one instance where they showed her standing on a stage with some people in drag outfits, and that was always the picture they ran mm -hmm. with it. And... Um, so, man, but I mean, in my own neighborhood, you know, drag queen story time is like the main thing they talk about. And the reason why is because they're deluged with it on the talk radio that they listen to during the week. Yeah. I don't think they talk anything else but that. Yeah. <laughs> now, one thing they won't talk about is that what do we do with refugees? Where's a good, safe place for them to live? Where's a place for them to get taken care of? That's not going to come up, you know? But what are we going to do, you know? with with the marginalization marginalization of certain people you know or or the climate and all of the bad weather that is causing and this and so they have to fill that void with stuff like this how long can they milk this cow man that's what i'm just wondering until they come up with another one well you know 10 years ago you, you know I what, do you have, what is next about you know? the muslim yeah you know the, the muslim was the was the bad one 10 years ago i mean how much do you hear about that now but but back then Everybody was tripping over themselves to say Sharia law was around the corner in America. Yeah, you had you had con you had conferences here in Nashville. Were, <laughs> yeah, I can't keep yeah. up with my writing. You know, I write about this stuff as fast as I can, and they moved on to something else, and I'm obsolete because they got an, a new boogeyman. 
you know, but it's sort of new one, same as the old one. But, but, but the, the, the question does come now that they've milked the pedophile thing, what do they do to top this? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like it's gonna be tough. Maybe, well, maybe some kind of like Nephilim creatures that absorb the life force out of us. I don't know if that would even be worse, but <laughs> yeah, they got to yeah. do something for an encore. It's some of the like really worst, cynical, pragmatic politics there is. And I mean, the good example of that was what happened with uh, DeSantis in Disney, right? Yeah. So this really just starts out as just some kind of like renegotiation of Disney's contract. You know, for whatever reason, I guess Florida wanted a little bit more of their money, a little bit more of the, a little bit more of the revenue, you know, or just like, you know, some kind of renegotiation of this kind of like almost Vatican City like status that Disney has in Florida. Right. So that's it. I mean, simple that like, but like Disney was, was not going to bend. So what does DeSantis do? Well, he started playing dirty and started, they started putting out this whole thing about Disney's after your kids, Disney are groomers They're you know, um, it, it, it was a way to get, and all it was was just a way to get Disney to bend. But, but at the same time, people become radicalized by that kind of stuff. It, well, it, he is God. He is God in Florida. Yeah. I've never seen a guy. They love him. They love him in Florida. Who yeah. comes up with something and before the day is over, he has had the legislature approve it. Yeah. He just floats something out at noon. In the end of the day, the legislature has already voted it in. Rubber to me, stamp. that's a little rubber, scary. Rubber stamp. Yeah. Yeah. There's no debate. There, there's not even they don't even debate it from the legislature, much less in the public forum for a, you know, a short period. He's ready to go. And will, will he do that? If he's likely president, will it, will it be that smooth sailing for him? I, I don't know, but it's the cynicism on top of it. You know, he mm -hmm. was really, really big on standing against anything with COVID protocols or anything to protect. And he beat his chest and, you know, anybody who was trying to do safety things, they were up to no good. Meanwhile, as I wrote about on, my, on the Two Spies report on my blog, uh, I show about how he had had this deal with the Israeli government where they were flying him over and Netanyahu was whining and dining him because they wanted to offload all of this hydroxychloroquine because the largest generic drug maker in the world is in Israel, Tiva. And the governments around the world were throwing the book at them for corruption and for bribes, including the Justice Department here. And Trump hadn't really capitulated to give in to them until this, this crisis came up and they told him, hey, we got a golden bullet for you, hydroxychloroquine. When the Justice Department was going to put him out of business in the U.S., which pretty meant permanently. And then Ron DeSantis got in the middle of it when he when he wasn't on the bad list of Trump, you know, and seen his arrival. And they flew him over there and cut this deal where millions of doses were brought through. None of that had to do with the safety of the American public on what they were doing. So when we see this mania that happens, there's always an exploiter that's taking advantage of it somehow. There's somebody cynically feeding something that they already know themselves is total BS. I mean, they're basically conspiracy farms at this point. Yeah. And that's the, that's, that's the only way they know how to draw support. They don't know how to do it by like coming up with real solutions to problems. You know, um, even this, some of my, you know, friends, I live in hardcore, you know, red hat Republican community. And, um, I've asked them about, you know, they'll, they'll get worked up about the drag Queens, you know, something that they pace the floor over all the time. I said, well, you know, we've got problems with health care. A lot of people don't have health care. We've got refugees. We've got things. I said, what was on the Republican platform this last time that was their solutions for these issues? And so they think for a while, well, I can't remember. What was it? Well, the answer is there were none because they had no platform, literally no platform approved at the last Republican convention. First time in the history of major political parties that when they had their major convention, they didn't actually vote on a platform. It's just personality. 
it was whatever the man in front said it was going to be on the fly. So there was no proposed solution for any of the main problems of society. Like I said, health care or poverty or environment or, you know, guns, what, whatever. You name what it is. It wasn't even addressed. There wasn't anything proposed for. It. And I, I think older politicians, you know, earlier in the century or whatever, they would have been aghast to think of a party like the Republican Party. It gotten so basically third worldish in how they operated that they wouldn't even have a consensus platform of what identified who they were and how they were going to bless society. Well, I guess it's because it's probably became pretty much a cult of personality by that point. You talk about the 2020 uh, platform. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and yeah, I mean, that's to me and the fact that people didn't care. It used to be that was the main part of the, you know, the whole convention was hammering out and negotiating what's our position going to be on this. And, and then the nominee was, was to carry out the, the platform, but it was like, here's the identity of our party on how we have to address the problems of society here for the next few years. They just sort of chucked it. Well, I mean, you know, looking into the future and I mean like the campaign, the campaigns are really going to get going here in 2023. I mean, Trump, Trump is already, uh, announced and he did that last month supposedly and we're recording this on the 14th of december supposedly there's supposed to be some kind of big announcement tomorrow by him i don't know what that's going to be about um that's just kind of something that i saw that people were posting on like say, on social media uh but you know we're talking about desantis i mean you think that uh, desantis is going to challenge him I mean, in 2024, do you think anybody is going to challenge him? Well, the polls that just came out today, just today that I saw televised, yeah. showed that two thirds of Republicans do not want him as their nominee. Now that don't was a want, don't that's want a Trump pretty as their nominee. Trump, yeah, Trump. Yeah. Now that's a pretty big turn. I mean, that's he would have had 50 percent, you know, earlier this year at least. Or more and so that is a big turn now desantis they showed in the data was only drawn 38 52 percent said anybody other than trump or somebody other than trump is what the republicans said yeah i don't know anything else about the demographics of who they talked to or whatever they were just republicans um and then everybody else was down in the noise so um my question is Will Trump try to burn down the house? Now, of course. He said, he said that he had dirt on DeSantis. Yeah. And the only way to get him out of the, get Trump out of the news on, on all the dirt and indictments he has is to deflect to somebody else. So, you know, that's enemy number one for him is DeSantis. So will he be effective? I don't know. Is has Trump crossed the Rubicon of being quickly irrelevant? Maybe. You know, but that's not that he won't do everything he can. The question is, how many people out there that are next to him that really have the power to help him with all this dirt? How many of them are sticking with Trump or moving on? Because he can't do that stuff himself. I mean, you know, he's. He's too busy sitting in the Mar-a-Lago, uh, you know, dining room bragging to everybody about the letters that he has from Kim Jong-un or whatever. He didn't have the wherewithal to do this stuff. He's going to have people close to him that can do it. And so are those people sticking with him? How many are going to be true blue Trumpers? The, the, the only ones I could suggest are the ones that they think they can't carve in an insider position with DeSantis. Those are the ones that have the only incentive to stick with Trump. You know, if they if if the if it's too crowded around DeSantis already for them to get their hanger on, then they might try to do the dirty work for you know for Trump. Yeah. But um, you know, I really think this year in general, and I don't want to divert because we can talk about this more. I think the years, at least the first half of it or more, is going to be defined by two men whose time has passed. And the real question is, are they going to take down the whole house with themselves or disappear quietly 
And nationally, that would be Donald Trump. And on the global scale, it's Vladimir Putin. I mean, both of them, they can't do much constructive, either one of them right now. But they mm -hmm. can do a whole lot destructive. What do you think about how we've kind of crossed the Rubicon on uh, Trump openly calling for uh, suspension of yeah. parts of the Constitution or right. this thing today where this uh, South Carolina representative's texts uh, asking Trump to declare martial law? I mean, the fact that this stuff has become normalized to a group of people who always use the talking point of defending the Constitution. Yeah, I never really thought we'd see such open talk well, you about know, this remember stuff. Flynn talking about how we, we what we could use as a coup, like what happened in, in Burma. Right. You know? Right. Well, after January 6th, none of this should surprise us. I mean, they're just, you know, Mark Meadows, the stuff that he has, they're still trying to get that stuff released to be able to see it, you know? Yeah. Um, this um, special counsel. He's a little bit of a Darth Vader for these guys. I mean, he's he's like a witch finder general. Yeah. I don't, I, yeah. you know, the angel of death. His problem is he can't make the actions directly. He can only give it to the Justice Department. And the, it's whether the, Merrick Garland, you know, has enough chutzpah to do something with it. The committee's done, right? They're done. I guess they're just going to issue their final report. Because, I mean, you know. Physically done in a few weeks when the new Congress yeah, comes in. Yeah, because Liz Cheney is not going to even be in Congress anymore. Well, and, and you know, Meadows, whoever's the Speaker of the House, is not going to let this go one more day. So, yeah, that's that's pretty much done. Um, you talking about um, McCarthy? McCar McCarthy, yeah. Yeah. McCarthy. But, um, so, I mean, the special counsel sounds like he didn't mess around. Um, but all he can do is turn it over with recommendations. Well, you know, I, I take that back. You know, um, if you remember the earlier one, Robert Mueller, he was able to actually take people to court and get them convicted of crimes. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, and he did a lot of that. Yeah. I, and, and most of that, he was doing the lower level people to try to get them to talk. Yeah. I don't know if we'll see more of that now or if it's too late. I don't know. You know, I, re I really don't know. Um, well, I mean, this is the thing. Is is the Justice Department going to do anything? Yeah. Well, and shame on Merrick Garland if they don't, if they sit on their hands. I mean, I think that's part of why Trump declared so early. So that he could play like, like he was untouchable or something. But something. Well, I guess I'm dumb or something. You know, maybe I've I never had a technical civics class, but w where did we get this idea that if somebody runs for president, they, they don't have to obey the laws? I, I don't get that where you, you're untouchable if you do that, because yeah. if that's the case, why didn't Al Capone declare he was running for president, right. you know, before they came and got him? I, I, I don't understand that how that if that's the get out of jail free card, you know, to do that. That's partly, you know. If he doesn't have a critical mass of people behind Trump, you know, Trump, it's iffy for him whether he'd have enough people circle the wagons around him. You know, if they start moving over to DeSantis quickly, they may not be that much fuss about them doing it. If he still has that loyal support, that could re-energize him. Yeah. So, you know, that's a big that's a big TBD. But I think overarching all this, getting back to your original question. That that despairs me more, and it and it's it goes beyond just the subject matter you brought up, is the fact that where the public is at right now, all of the people that are his supporters that are conservatives are never even going to hear the stuff that you just said when you ask your question about you know the stuff about overturning the Constitution. They simply do not cover it in conservative talk radio and other channels. And so it is, you know, if I talk to my neighbors about it, they often just don't believe me. We should add, it's not just Fox News anymore. Yeah. People like to talk about Fox News, you know, but like you've got, you know, people are watching, you know, I mean, this stuff is the, is very loose now and people are watching OAN, they're watching Newsmax. You know, you can literally watch Steve Bannon on one of these things. If you've got, you know, America's, America's voice, voice yeah. on there is uh, 
it's for people who find OAN not conservative. Is that Steve Bannon? Steve Bannon. Yeah. He's their he's their main guy. He does War Room. The other guy that they have on there, surprisingly, is um because you watch this stuff. I mean we, we don't. We don't watch yeah, this stuff. You take it for the team, yeah. Mike. You take it for the team. You Somebody has to. A little bit of my soul yeah. dies every minute I watch it. <laughs> but but the other guy is um the uh the televangelist prophet. What's his name? Um I've talked to him about you, sir. I mean, about him several times here. Jim Baker, God's Chaos candidate author. Oh, uh, one of the Wal Kansas City Wal prophets. Wallnow, Lance, Lance Wallnow. Yeah, Lance Wallnow. He's one of the headliners, and you watch him. There's like no spiritual Christian stuff talked about one iota. It's yes. all just extreme hard right stuff. It's like he doesn't even have to bother with that spiritual stuff anymore. Well, well go back to your point with the point you were trying to make. I'm well, the first first repeating. point is. Is that you got the public side of the public that needs to hear it is not going to hear it. By the way, the old people they may not see that other stuff, but I know relatives that are glued to talk radio. They don't even they don't have cable, you know they don't they don't pay for anything, they don't feel comfortable being online all the time, but they love talk radio while they listen to it the day. The second part is maybe even worse is that if even if they did hear about it and it caused a problem you ask them a week or two later they don't remember anything about it i mean everything is so yesterday and that and that's what i run into and why i spend all my time instead of like doing fun stuff trying to document all this stuff and as boring as i'll get out documenting it is because nobody remembers it yeah it's not it's not even part of the conversation oh don't you remember he said this, or this is what happened, what Mueller found. Like, for example, I'll just give you a for instance in Mueller findings. One of the things nobody seemed to make a big deal out of was that um, his campaign manager, um, Trump's campaign manager, went to jail. Um, you know, the main guy, that, um, the real dirty one. Paul Manafort. Paul Manafort. Yeah. He and Stone were like pretty close. Yeah. Pa but Paul Manafort was yeah. the official campaign manager. Right. He was giving all of the critical polling required to win the election on all the, the swing states to a universally well-known top intelligence official of the of the Russians. Yeah. Why? Why, 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 why was he giving that? Do, do you remember anybody he else talking about that? Well, he went to jail too because he was a lot of that was, yeah, that he was dealing with pro Russian Ukrainians. Right, exactly. Yeah, he had all kinds of involvement with all kinds of foreign governments. I he's mean, he's got guy, so much dirt. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you could pick what you want to convict. He is the lobbyist of all lobbyists. I mean, just, yeah. Filthy. Right. But, but all that stuff about giving stuff to the Russians like that, I, I thought that should be a slam dunk case of collusion. You know, now the question would be how much did it's it's hard to believe the campaign manager would know without Trump knowing. But let's say even if Trump didn't know the fact that you had a campaign manager who already was known to be dirty. He was already known when he picked him to give this to the top spy in America. I would think that'd be a big deal. It was confirmed, you know, by Mueller, but nobody knows or even remembers it or cares to remember. And so, it, you know, that's the bigger problem I see with where society is now is that all you have to do is survive the first week of a scandal. If you survive the first week and, you know, there's a lot of people, for example, like Senator uh, up in Minnesota, um, Al Franken, he got in trouble for pretending for a picture like he was going to grab the breast of a woman who who was known her livelihood in the public was was being topless in Fredericks of Hollywood catalog. What was it like 15 years before or something? It was this was right as the Me Too movement was going on, like really getting started. Yeah. But it happened in like 2003. Yeah. yeah. And 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 so and I'm, I'm not absolving him. OK, all I'm just saying is this is something that was her shtick. That was her angle. OK, and so he was sort of playing along with it. He didn't touch her as far as I know. Now, he may have pinched some bottoms of some other women's and so be it.
But what happened was when that came out, what was it? The shortest of time, he said, okay, I'm, I'm giving up my seat. Yeah. Now, you got guys like Matt Gates and these other people yeah, yeah. involved underage right. women yeah. and all this other stuff going yeah. on. Everything that the the, the, the QAnon people and all, it's, it's become more mainstream now. Everything that we talked about with the groomers, Matt Gates was involved with all that. It was just like Epstein. You know, yeah, and, and his it, yeah. his feeder, right? Like his his best friend who fed him, he went to jail for it. But all he did was he was just arrogant enough, like I ain't budget. I don't care what you say, and you know, in a week's time, people move on. Yeah. So there's going to have to be some people who say, "I'm not dropping this." Can well, you imagine the, if we were like this society when uh, when Dreyfus went to jail in France at the turn of the century? You know, he would have had an impassioned trial for a week, you know, for being set up, and then everybody would have moved on to something else. The world that we live in is just so driven by social media. Social media is just short attention span. That's all it is. You know, I'm surprised you're even giving it a week, Mike, because it almost seems like it's like two or three days. It's like it's it's like everything that like we, we experience with Trump. We could just take Trump as an example. Everything we experience with Trump was just like it was just like a mini Watergate almost like you know every two or three weeks but like you know Watergate was just one thing and it took years to really get really to for it to really get going for people to really see it but it's just like you know we're so inundated by information that people I think have just become numb they've just become numb to all of it and it starts to have no meaning yeah so I think that's why you know but but it's just like something powerful like the whole thing they're coming for your children thing you know that's much more powerful much more basic for you know really like i've always said for even for like mammals like you really type into something really basic but just like people will find these just these weird causes but everything else is just like is kind of just real it just it just gets swept under the rug um i mean it's basically you know steve bannon what did he say just you know the, 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 the infrasphere was spit was shit. That's what he said. Yeah, right. And you know, it's a little variation of Stalin's thing about one death is a tragedy, yeah. a million deaths is a statistic. I mean, right. you you could look at each thing that Donald Trump did, and not just him. There's other people we can list, but just him, for example. Each one of those things he did was a little death of democracy, a little depth of decency, a single depth, and they were a tragedy. And if if you did one of those things, that would forever taint a person. What about Hunter Biden's la laptop, Mike? Don't you want to? I know. I know. And that's why when they controlled both chambers of Congress and the Justice Department, that's why they were so effective in getting a conviction of him, right? When they controlled all the levers of power for four years. Yeah. That, that's why they were able, with all the power they had, to be able to put Hillary Clinton in jail and to be able to put Hunter Biden in jail. Well, this is what this is what's going to happen. They're going to investigate this, right? And there are some investigations of Hunter Biden, and if he did some bad shit, he should probably go to jail. I agree one hundred percent with you. If if there's something he broke a law, it just kind of looks like he's smoking crack and and, and showing his dick. I mean, that's kind of all it looks like. To me. Well, you know, I've tried to figure him out. I mean, he's definitely the black sheep of the family. Yeah, but I wonder. I'm not a counselor or anything, but I wonder if. It's another case, you know, with him and his brother of a tale of two cities on how they responded to that, that crisis um, trauma of losing their mom and their sister in that car accident. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely got some issues and he's definitely, he, got, he a had, drug, he's definitely got a drug problem and, you know, all this kind right. of stuff. But, but every like, brother handles it differently. The other brother seemed like he had a pretty, you know, reputable, admirable life. But then you take the other one and they don't handle it so well. And I'm not excusing him, okay? I mean, I'm with you. If he did something wrong, you got to honor the law. Once, but once the once the Republicans, you know, they've, they've got the House, once that happens, they're going to start investigating that kind of stuff. And it's going to just, it's just going to log jam. Well, maybe, I wondered if maybe that's a better way to spend their time on than the, the other things that they destroy that might be true that might be true you know that would be their pacifier Let's, you know to uh, keep keep them busy 
Do we want to get any predictions first for uh, all the stuff we've been talking about? Do you have like a bullet list, Mike? Well, I mean, talking about domestically, I just think, and I've been saying this for actually a long time, but I think one of the most fascinating times and sort of alarming times in America is going to start this summer because the Republican, um, you know, the, the debates begin. If you remember, you remember eight years ago, it all started with that trip down the escalator. Well, now you got, if, if Trump stays in, if he still stays in by summer, if he's still in it, you know, he's not had something else legally done to him. Uh, can you imagine what he's going to do swinging at DeSantis and everybody else? I mean, it's going to be anything could happen. And then the question is, how many people stay with him, power brokers, to be throwing mud on him or anybody else mainstream that comes in? Will there be a mainstream candidate that emerges or are they going to be fractured? You know, where they quickly get because the way the primaries work, if you have a loyal core, you can pick off when there's a whole ton of mainstream people because they're all getting small draws, you know. So but I think the rhetoric, we think it's bad now. The rhetoric is going to be really bad starting the summer because that's when you start playing for keeps. And um, so the second half of the year, I think, is just going to be insane from running. Yeah. You know, the other thing is, is will. Joe Biden run. Who knows? You know, yeah. I mean, who knows on that? Uh, if, if you do have a health scare, that can stop it on him or Trump, either one. It could just stop on a heartbeat. Well, excuse the pun. But, you know, um, and so <laughs> anything could could happen with that. But I really think it's going to be, you know, intense. Well, you know, from the you- second half of this year. All right. You and I were, yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's going to heat up. That's, that's for sure. And then who knows how 2024 is going to be and how it's going to turn out. Uh, you and I were actually talking about Mike yesterday. Like there's like, there is scuttlebutt and there is rumors that like he could choose Marjorie Taylor green as his running mate. <laughs> and like, you know, 2025, he oh, actually buddy. gets in there or like, you know, or like he just does the coup and then like, you know, Trump drops dead. I mean, he does eat a lot of McDonald's, so I mean, you never know what, what could happen. But just like you know, then Marjorie Taylor Greene is president, so just you know, you, we'll, you think we'll about just let well, that sink in for a second. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it didn't make Putin look so bad. <laughs> you know, uh, the 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 practicality though is, I think about her. What does she add to Donald Trump? True. I mean, what did he do to expand to make his agenda more likely to happen? It's almost they're just totally coincident. They just overlap. Yeah. But she's got a lot of, I mean, her influence is really growing. You know, they're already talking about like how basically McCarthy needs kind of her little block to become Speaker of the House. Like he's not exactly as much, of, he's probably going to get it, but he's not as much of a shoe in as like what, um, a lot of people think so you never the only the only well first of all trump at least knows he has to win so i don't know if he's going to expand the base enough i mean look he picked mike pence not because mike pence was you know was just like him i seriously doubt pence is going to sign back up after the you know he tried to kill his own vice get his own vice president killed but but he picked him for a he was a bootlicker b he could get the religious right more cemented and see he was seen as semi mainstream. Yeah. Okay. And, and and so that's partly, and that may have helped him. I don't know, you know, particularly with the religious right. And so the only reason I would see him picking Marjorie Taylor green is if, um, he wanted to groom her for being the heir apparent because, well, I mean, he could pick his son. I mean, you know, I mean, his son, He's trying uh, he, to groom him too, but he now he wouldn't pick Ivanka. She she's already uh, she's already messed up. Her 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 and her husband have decided they don't want to even be part of this campaign. So you know she's about as welcome there as William or uh, Harry is with the royals. You know, and so um, it would have to be Don Junior. 
you know, or, or like I said, he could, he could bring her in, but you know, he, he, he had the, like the opposite of the Midas touch in the, uh, elections, these kind of people he would have mm -hmm. promoted. They went down in flames. So, you know, there's another woman who's a Congresswoman. Her name escapes me. She was, she was mainstream woman. She was considered very much a mainstream, but she became more of the attack dog for him in Congress. And I can't think of her name, but somebody like that is who I would think would be a more likely person he would try to get. And, you know, unless unless they were a celebrity or something, you know, like Kanye or something. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think that's going to happen. But, yeah. Uh, some, so yeah. I, 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 I can't <laughs> think of the woman's name, but she she was a mainstream congresswoman that in the last four years became a hardcore. She she was one of the real attack dogs on the uh you know, some of the panels they had in Congress on behalf of, of Trump. And so, I, you know, those are the kind of ones I think he would try to expand his base to break well, through into the mainstream. But, you know, he's got he's got an uphill battle. Let's talk about Ukraine. Let's get into this. Um, to me, this is the biggest thing of the year. You know, I mean, this is a major war in Europe. Um, and, and nobody really can tell where this thing is going to go. I mean, you know, the Ukrainians have done very well, but something could turn on a dime at any point, or we're just like going to be just in a stalemate, you know, and, and really the inter the international system has just been pretty interrupted by all this. And we had a, the probably the biggest scare that we've had since the end of the Cold War with the threat of like a nuclear, actual nuclear confrontation. Now, I don't know if it necessarily would come to that, but like, you know, people really, you know, talking about him using a tactical nuclear weapon and, and all this type of thing, which I don't necessarily think that he's quite there yet. But, you know, I mean, if they get closer to Crimea, I think that could possibly happen. Where does this go? And it affects our own political system. And, and you know, Putin uh, has a lot of pull here. And in other in other countries, I mean, the Russians have laid a groundwork of propaganda for the last 10, 15 years in a lot of Western countries. Oh, yeah. Anybody who's a traditionalist really is big pro Putin. I'm surprised some of the people that, you know, um, publicly like Peter Goodgame, you know, used to be very popular in our circles. He's one of the biggest apologists for Putin. Um, you know who the guy was who used to be my mentor. Um, most of the stuff I hear, he's defense, e even worse than Putin, of the Russian Orthodox Church, which which is really the ones who, clearly, in my view, based on my study, are the ones that started all this. Th this war should be called the Russian Orthodox Church Holy War. I mean, if it's looked at that way, then we understand why this is happening. So, um, you know, a lot of people I know are big apologists for Putin. A lot of it, they justify the anti-gay stuff. They hate gay people so much that they like Putin and the Orthodox Church because they're so staunchly anti-gay. And what the what Putin and his peers do over there is show that the same thing that you hear in our conservative channels that the only people who run everything over here in America are, um, you know, drag queens and transsexuals and gay people that basically run everything and force everybody to be one here. That's the kind of stuff they say over there in their media. And that's why they justify invading and killing people. Somehow that makes that justified to invade and kill, even if it were true, which is ridiculous. But if it were true, they somehow justify that's That's why we have to kill women and children and elderly people in Ukraine is because everybody's gay in America. Yeah, it, it's about setting up an existential threat that if they don't stand up to the demonic West, then um, their culture and way of life is going to be wiped out by the globalist eventually transhumanist agenda and a lot of this is coming from guys like dugan yeah and but a bunch of other people too i mean dugan takes more of the occult 
side of it, but the Russian Orthodox Church and their sympathizers are a bigger force. And there's there's two things that are going to be in conflict. You know, we talked about the short attention span of the public. They get all worked up with something and then move on. You know, they got really bored with COVID. You know, after a while, it went on and on and on, and they want to move on. This war would be the same thing. They want to move on from it. But the problem is it's it's getting into the kind of war unless there's some big game changer that looks like World War I. I'm sure you all seen the pictures that I have where they show Bakhmut in these places, and it is virtually identical to the look of the Western Front in World War I. Yeah. With all the trees cut off almost to the ground, it's just a sea of like timbers cut because of artillery, and then the trenches. I mean, it's real life trench warfare going on. And so this is stuff that just drags on and on, and who can have the more artillery rounds fired for how long, just heavy attrition. That goes counter to people who like shock and awe. They want some whiz bang. Okay, well, let's get this wrapped up, move on to something else. And so I don't know how that's going to play out. You know, there used to be a joke in the 60s that the war has been canceled due to lack of interest. <laughs> now, when, when you're an autocrat like Putin, you don't have to worry about that because you, you basically say whatever, just keep the munitions going or we'll get them from North Korea or we'll get them from Iran. And if the economy is collapsing on the people, well, that's their problem. They don't have have really any say in it you know um but on the west side the west side has been so spoiled and has such a short-term attention span they're going to get tired of it the republicans already want to pull back there's a major part not all the republicans but a major segment of the marjorie teller green segment that does not want anything else going over there yeah well i think mccarthy has said that he's going to review any kind of package that gets sent to Ukraine. Now, it's okay to do auditing, you know, to make sure that money goes to the right things. I think that's proper, you know, for our taxpayer money to make sure it gets in the right hands and you don't have middlemen siphoning it off, you know. Um, there's there's another phenomena here that I guess is a little sensitive, but uh, shouldn't be, um, that I've observed that I don't know any kind of long-term implications of it. But one of the things I will say about the Ukrainians is they are some incredibly savvy PR people. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't mean that in a, I mean, in a neutral sense, I'm not throwing mud on them or concern or, or promotion, either one. I'm just saying it's a fact that they have done a marvelous job in terms of their own personal interest and how to manage social media and other things. And I have to say, even I, who am sort of a neophyte to social media and Twitter, there are certain sites on there where you actually get stuff on the ground that's happening every day. And it can be addictive because you're seeing the stuff that's really happening out on the edge. Now, you have to be careful. You don't know when that footage, when it was shot, you know, you don't, you can look at the, if, if there's leaves on the trees and they say it's happening today, you have to say, uh, I don't think so. Well, you know, just like, I mean, I think that, you know, we're dealing with two post-Soviet states. And so both Russia and Ukraine are, you know, I mean, the Soviets were masters of propaganda. So I think, you know, I think the Ukrainians understand that just as well as the Russians do. But, but I've just been impressed for like the, you know, the little train that could or whatever it was, how well they have, because what, what they have shown is a more of a modernistic kind of like wry wit about themselves. I mean, they're an existential, existential battle for their existence. But yet, what do they do? They focus on the, the guys on Snake Island telling the ship to go F yourself. Yeah. yeah. To the point right. that they're issuing stamps with that on stamps. Right, right. You know, I mean, I think they've even got stamps of the Russians hauling off refrigerators and stuff. I mean, <laughs> they have turned the memes that they have turned to these things or when they stole a raccoon out of the, the thing, you know, they even in the darkest situation they've had this sort of black humor that is it's resonated they're really casting the the russians as thieves and bumbling idiots and drunks yeah yeah right brutes you know and so i think they've done well and i think 
this has affected somebody else. And I may be way off on this and these are my personal views and not your show. But I think somebody who maybe is just a little bit jealous of how effective they've been when you're a little company or a little country with an existential threat that depends upon public opinion has been Israel. Because they're doing the kind of things, their their sell job on letting them be like the, the, the small heroic David versus Goliath. This was always sort of the part and parcel of Israel. And Israel were masters, at least keeping the religious right. Not, not so much outside of the U.S., but they were able to keep the U.S. on board with, you know, when they would go in and take those settlements against the U.N. and everything. They could, their Hezbera, we, you know, you know the Hezbera thing, which is their requirement to look out for their, the nation of Israel, even if you don't live there, uh, and to promote their interest. Well, I think they're seeing a little bit of a greater Hezbera from Ukraine, and, and Israel has been extremely muted. You know, when, when they had the original declarations of uh, against um, Russia, Israel declined. There were several groups where they Israel vetoed mm -hmm. a, a negative statement against Russia. And part of the reason was they said, we, you know, we get our weaponry. We have deals with them in Syria with the Russians on things. And so they got looked at as being sort of a bad guy because they sabotaged some consensus agreements that Israel did. Now, just recently they've started giving some backdoor permissions, but of course they had to get paid for this. It's not like they're donating anything, but they got paid to allow some of their Israeli technology that the U S uses. They gave it permission to be used in Ukraine. I'm wondering if some of that maybe is a hold up on some of the Patriots, but that's a pure speculation that there might be some Israeli twists to the Patriots they use that the U S you know, had permission to use that we were required, but there was certain Israeli technology. They gave permission for third parties that they could buy it from the Israelis and give it to Ukraine. But I mean, we're talking small stuff, really small stuff. I've gone back and looked at Debka. If you remember Debka, mm -hmm. which was a pretty, you know, yeah, I'll say in a neutral sense, propaganda. Okay. It, it was sort of military porn site. Uh, now much of Twitter has become that. But at the time, they were in the early days. A lot of religious right people love Debka because it's like reading the book of Revelation. You know, they give them what they want. Uh, they are extremely muted on there. I mean, they're not saying a whole lot. So I don't know if anything will come of that. But I just find it very, very curious that I almost see like they, they feel like they, they had their thunder stolen a little bit. And it would be wonderful if Israel came to the assistance because they would be a wild card. NATO is afraid about escalation on their scale with Russia. But what if Russia came? I mean, what if Israel came in? They'd make mincemeat of those hapless Russians. Well, that would cause Russia to invade Israel, and you know that that's Ezekiel 38. I mean, you know. I know. Yeah, that, that, I know. I are thought you trying, get, are you trying to get it started, Mike? Are you trying <laughs> to get the Gog-Magog war started? Yeah, I, sh I should be just like the good prophecy buffs who uh, promote the Third Temple or the Temple Institute where the Antichrist will be. <laughs> Milk it. Coronated, you know. It's funny, just as an aside, I thought about this the other day. I was like, N all this stuff with Russia and Ukraine, no one has talked about that. I don't think anyone in the prophecy community, they're always about that. Russia is going to invade Israel. That's the Gog Magog war from Ezekiel 38. No one has talked about, I don't think anybody's talked about that. And like Russia and Iran are kind of getting closer together. So isn't Persia supposed to be involved? And like Turkey supposed to be involved, you know? Yeah. And like, but nobody, like nobody's, you know, we're Skywatch TV, you know, they're not, Rapture ready. Where where are they? You know, they just, you guys are miss. You guys are missing it. You guys are missing the cash cow. Skywatch is busy talking about Obama and that Lucifer pact. Because I'm really concerned about that, and we'll talk about that. But uh, probably should have like a prayer vigil over it. What's your prediction with the Ukraine war? I mean, what about the? Do you think that he would use a tactical nuclear weapon? It kind of goes back and forth. I I feel like just in my own research and examining it and watching it. I feel like the tactical nuclear weapon thing is a lot of us saying that. I feel like I feel like some of this comes from the fact that 
in the past, the United States itself has talked about using tactical nuclear weapons. Korea comes to mind. It wasn't just MacArthur that talked about that. There were thoughts about in North Vietnam using it. So I feel like that's where this comes from, is that the United States said, well, you know, if we were in this position, we would probably use tactical nuclear weapons, so Putin might use one. I feel like that's where it comes from. You know who I think has the biggest incentive to convince us this could happen? And, and I'm talking about through the entire Cold War, and that is the American defense industry. The American defense industry through like the Team B report in this, or Team A report, excuse me, and I think that they actually have tried to sell that that their hand is hovering over the button all the time in Russia. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're a student of history, like like I know you all are, and you think about Russia, how they handled the Cuban Missile Crisis and other things like this, it appears to me that they are much more afraid of things going nuclear even than we are. Now, that's not always intuitive because you would think well the russians don't care about losing a lot of the population you know just like they don't mind losing their soldiers they'll just go underground moscow because they've planned for that so maybe they'd be less reticent than we value human life a lot more over here but i think they're actually more afraid of the western power than we let on and you look at a guy like khrushchev you know he backed down and he backed down partially for some humane reasons, you know, why he lost his position after that. And what the public didn't know either was that, you know, we were going to be putting missiles in Turkey, if I remember right. You correct me if I'm wrong. We already Adam. had missiles in Turkey. But, you know, this was their, theirs yeah. was a reaction to what we did right. in Cuba when they were doing that. And so part of that deal was that JFK told them, don't let out that we're taking these out of Turkey. So it was to deceive the American public of what was done. I don't think we ever actually along. really took them out of Turkey. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> actually did it. So, so I think um, we always think about the Red Menace as just being this unstoppable force. But if you're an open-eyed student of history, you find out they have a tremendous fear. They talk big for their own public consumption and for us, but they have, they have bigger fears over here. And the, the worst thing that could happen is if, let's say if he's in advanced state of illness, uh, which he may well be Putin, and either he wants to go out with a bang to be always remembered, or he just simply becomes irrational because of things going on in his head or medication or whatever, he could do something irrational. And that would be a possibility. But even having said that, I would think things are more likely than not that the he's not going to go down there and push that button himself. They still have a chain of command that has to be passed through. Right. And I think it would be unlikely there wouldn't be somebody in that chain that stepped out. Yeah, but how it would start is he would use just, they would use just one, set off a small one, well, that would I mean, be that, even more. That would be stupid. More stupid yeah. because what we've already said is that not only would our you know B twos go in and just eliminate their standing army there in Ukraine, but their entire Black Sea fleet would be taken out. Yeah, but he might not have any other choice but to launch his whole nuclear arsenal at NATO at that point. <laughs> so, I where does it escalate? That well. Well, then his, his, his better approach would be to lead with that. You know, that would be his, his better approach. And in fact, he's been talking about, we got to get rid of this no first strike policy we have. The fact that he's t talking about that out loud tells me he's probably not going to do it. Yeah, I got like that it, that is probably a bluff, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think probably the, the biggest fear is some you know he gets irrational due to his health or medication um but i still think he's got handlers in between them that still love their grandchildren and still love others and if if, if he had the button himself and immediately the missile took off that's one thing but he's got to command people in a military chain to eventually turn those keys yeah, but would they really re i mean 
he's surrounded by sycophants at this point. I mean, nobody's, I mean, he's, you know, I mean, you know, near I mean, him, they are near him, but you get down through the military down below, yeah. you get less of that connection. Well, what happens too, if, if he is out, like he gets overthrown and a more right wing forces take over that decide, oh, we, we should use a nuclear weapon. But like, there's been assessment about that, that like Putin really is the only thing that's holding Russia together. Like it would be a huge power vacuum. You know, there might be a successor president, but there would be a huge power. There would be a huge power struggle after. They need a good civil war to keep them occupied. Yeah. And and the rest of us can just get out of their way. You know, well that that may be inevitable anyway. That they have something like you know they could have a stronger strong man than him. But I mean, heck. They haven't been able to get through Ukraine. I mean, really, really. I mean, you know, yeah, they can throw a lot of nukes and kill a lot of people and whatever, but are they going to accomplish any objective? Yeah, I, I, I mean, all that is is just a Samson option. You know, you take down the the Temple of Dagon on top of yourself and everybody else. There, there there's no no plan out of that where you, where you actually say, well, now Russia gets to run everything. No. There'd be nothing where they survived initiating any of that. It's well, just, you know, it's just taking out everybody. Yeah, it's kind of stalemated. It really has. I mean, the big the big thing has been the infrastructure attacks and using like the Iranian drones, which is an, an interesting aspect of this war where for the first time you've got drones like fighting each other, which has been really interesting. One one of my, one of the favorite myths I heard over there was the was the old babushka woman there in Ukraine, who who was in like a upper level apartment building and saw one of the smaller drones or reconnaissance drones and she threw a potted plant and knocked it out, <laughs> and she became like a folk hero there. And that's part of again is this is this true? That's, who knows? You know. It's a good story, and you know the thing is they've taken these kind of figures like that and made postage stamps out of them. You know, and that's uh, why they're responding a little bit more to like where people are at today. You know, they're meme masters. They're really good at coming up with memes at this kind of stuff. And that resonates with people. What, what I have seen watching Twitter and watching people who are like across the spectrum is that it appears the, the worst of the worst, the hell is in Bakhmut. In Bakhmut, all heck is broken loose in artillery. I mean, it's it's Stalingrad right now in Bakhmut. And it's a meat grinder, and all Ukraine's trying to do is just hold it. And Putin is throwing the overwhelming majority of everything he's got in Ukraine at that one village. It, it, it doesn't even have much strategic benefit anymore. Sort of like how Hitler did. He, he got really focused on Stalingrad just simply because Stalin's name was in it. And they had all those oil fields and everything else that he went away from just to go get it and that stop uh, putin is making the same i think error by doing that but um that what they're waiting for i think in three or four weeks the ground freezes mm -hmm. ukraine right. has said that's when we're going to do our major offensive maneuvers is when the ground freezes because the mud they can't move heavy equipment you know, much on highways they can, but you know, nowhere else. And so they're, they're getting all their ducks in a row. Now, one of the things that's very old school about this war, unlike, well, in addition to the world war one trench warfare, which is like really bona fide trench warfare going on is the fact that it's so drawn out now, not like the, you know, we're used to having wars these days that last a, a month. And, and then you just have insurgencies. But, you know, the main war is shock and all. Well, now we have enough time where both parties are trying to, like, manufacture more weapons. That's very World War II-ish. We're actually, you know, you're, you're having a manufacturing war back and forth. When, when I was working in the Air Force labs, the thought all along was the big war is only going to last a few days. 
So you only got what you have in inventory. And one of the things they focused on was battle damage repair. Like on airplanes, you had to hurry up and get an airplane back for one more mission because that's probably all it was going to be able to do anyway. And so, but it, the, the whole battle plan operation was that it was a few days before somebody was wiped out. Well, that hasn't been that way with this. And so now they're trying to outmanufacture each other. So Iran is setting up manufacturing plants in Russia for them to make the Iranian drones. Well, I just heard now that Ukraine is manufacturing Turkey's drones, which, which actually they, they what was it? It was like, I forgot the name of that drone they use. It begins with a B from Turkey. But they've actually, they have like a patron saint. I don't know if you've seen like the saint, it looks like Mary, but it's named after the drone. And they also oh. pray to, uh, to St. Javelin, which is like the American anti-tank Javelin. This is part of how they've sort of made this hip, you know. I, I would like to point out that on our side here, that uh, someone is making big money. Oh, yeah. Off, uh, off the Ukraine. Big well, they got to replenish. They got to replenish all that yeah. stuff. Probably a lot yeah. of people you used to work with, Mike, are making huge dollars. Probably. But now some of that, there's a mixture. Some of that is Western stuff. And now the Patriot, and now they're supposed to get that. That's going to be a step up. But the other part of what they had to use was old Russian stuff. Because everything they had used was MiGs and old Russian like tanks. And so that what they were trying to do was to use like Central European NATO countries tanks. So there's been a mixture of like American kind of stuff, but most of that small stuff like those Javelin anti-tank missiles. The other stuff almost all had to be old Soviet stuff because that's the only stuff they knew and knew how to repair. So they got all of the like the T-72 tanks, uh, some T-90 tanks. They have MiG airplanes. This is the Ukrainians. You got any of your, your patents in anything, Mike? You know, what I'd really like, the, <laughs> the one there in Latvia, you know, the, the Latvian um, N2 Global product, uh -huh. uh, they put that in armored vehicles in Latvia. And the Baltic states are actually some of the most pro-Ukrainian countries between them and, you know, like oh, Estonia, yeah. Lithuania, Latvia. Yeah, there's no love for the, there's no love for the Russians. <laughs> they, there's no, in, yeah. I, I, I think they should donate some of the stuff over there, at least to put in, because, you know, the, the system I developed is to put out fire in, in not only vehicles, but like highly critical control system buildings and computer things. So they should be putting this stuff inside the um, power system things to it, because it'll knock out the fire in a fraction of a second. Yeah. So that's where I'd like to see them donate some of that stuff, if anything, just to popularize it. So, uh, and they're, and they're basically, you know, they're like a little tower. You just sit down on the floor and turn the switch on. You don't have to build anything. That's Mike's little piece of the military industrial complex. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Even though I don't get anything for it anymore, it's long gone, but like the fire panel things, you know, invention I had that they put on the Humvees and stuff to keep the IEDs and RPGs from exploding. You know, I don't know whether they would use that in any of the things in Ukraine or not. I don't know, but you know, I'm out, I'm all out of that mess, man. I'm trying to save the world. So, so we think that probably that it's probably just going to keep going. You know, I don't, I don't see the Ukrainians getting any, I don't know. I just, I, 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 I there's there at certain point, there needs to be some kind of negotiation. I don't see them getting Crimea back. Uh, they may not get the the east back at some point you know there's got to be like you know somebody's got to if it stalemates more I think that there's going to have to be some kind of negotiation well which Ukrainian people do you want to go tell them that they're going to have to be subject to the Russians Mike I just yeah I, I, I know I, I, I understand that but it's not you know, I mean, this you have to look, you got to look at it just from the point of view of, you know, strategy. Well, that's all you can do. Well, you know, the, the Chamberlain approach of peace in our time by giving Czechoslovakia or whatever, you know, to stop things. Um, 
when you deal with a power like a Nazi Germany or Putin's Russia, they always interpret those as vindication and as victory. And also it empowers them for round two. Yeah. What you basically tell them is good job. You came away with something, but our own now government, behave yourself our, for a while and get ready for the next our, piece. Our, our own government, our own state department has been telling the Ukrainians to start negotiating. You know, there's been other Western countries that have done that too. And like, I understand the moral issue. I get I that. I think that's a big mistake. I think it's a short sighted vision. People are being short sighted and they're look, probably looking at their own political career because again, Russia will take that as a victory. And what they will say is, we need all we need to do is to buy time. We'll behave ourselves. We'll rearm, and then we go for round two. And so, a firm hand. I mean, it's 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 scary when you you know when you got to go in front of a bully on the playground, and there's nothing but confrontation that will do. You can't reasonably explain why everybody doesn't want their lunch money taken. You know, it's scary to confront. But all you're going to do is get death by a thousand cuts unless you address it. And as long as, and I, I, I agree with um, President Zelensky, how can there be peace while Putin is still in power? We're talking about avoiding a, a, a apocalyptic <laughs> nuclear war, though. I mean, w will that eliminate the chance of an apocalyptic nuclear war if they capitulate and give that? Will that suddenly be off the table? It'll just be the next the next land grab will be the same place we were again. Same thing over and over again. You know, it, well, it basically rewards bad behavior. And, uh, you know, I complain about that with uh, Mrs. Bennett here when she when our little dog gets his shoe and runs away and she'll give him a milk bone if he'll drop it. It's like, what did he learn from that? Are you equating uh, Buster to, to Putin? The latter, they have a lot of commonalities. <laughs> Although Buster may be more intelligent, but well, you know that's that's the thing. I I don't think when you got people, it's you know I, I worked in Russia for a while. Yeah, and I really liked the people I met over there. I thought that they were a, a very personable, very giving people. They are. Well, at least the older folk really do, really endure a lot, but you know, I'm I now have a little more holistic view watching because that was a long time ago. You know, I was quarter of a century ago or more since I was there. Is that um, they're like MAGA on steroids? Now there there is a minority of people, particularly young people, who want to live in the modern world. But they're overwhelmingly overnumbered by the middle aged and older people who only watch state TV and and they believe we're all Nazis, either we're all gay or Nazis or both in the West and in Ukraine. And they really accept all that stuff. They don't even believe their own children when their children are deployed and sent over there and they call back their parents and say, look. I'm seeing Russian stuff hit civilian infrastructure. These are Russian soldiers calling their, their parents and their parents don't believe them. And it blows their mind. The kids minds that, that, that their, their, their own parents don't believe them when they say what they're seeing in front of their own eyes. So, you know, I've said before many times, we don't have a Donald Trump problem. We have a Donald Trump follower problem. And I think the same thing could be said about Russia. You know, the world doesn't have a Vladimir Putin problem. In many ways, it has a Vladimir Putin follower problem. And while there's been incredibly brave people that have tried to stand up just like they did in Iran and a few of these other places, it's nowhere near a critical mass. And so, you know, e even if Putin drops over tomorrow, you've still got that Vladimir Putin problem. Uh, you know, you think about what happened in Germany and particularly Japan after World War II. They were so out of touch with what reality was that you almost had to have complete surrender 
because then the re-education process had to be underway because the Japanese people had no concept of what the modern world was. And I think the Russian people are in that same boat. They've been so surrounded. I'm talking about the middle-aged and older Russian. Right. Yeah. We're just, All they watch are state with... TV and media. And yeah. so they're like MAGA on steroids. Right. Because so we, there's a lot of commonalities between the two, but there's a, you know, right now we, we teeter on a 50, 50. Yeah. We're way better off if you can believe it. Yeah. Right. right. And so, um, until you have the kind of unconditional surrender like Japan did, you can't start solving the real problem there, which is not a Vladimir Putin problem in Russia. It's a Vladimir Putin follower problem. And there's going to be a fundamental re-education, and it probably won't be fixed with their generation. I think there and probably here in America, it's going to have to be like what happened with the children of Israel out of Exodus, where that generation had to actually die out before they were ready for the next phase of civilization. I, I don't know if they could be reprogrammed any more than those Japanese in Okinawa that were jumping off the cliffs when the GIs came up to them, you know? You know, they told them they'd eat them, you know, if they came there and they were jumping off cliff in front of them. So I don't know if the older generation can be. But as, as I was saying a minute ago, the young people of Russia, many of them who have been deployed, can't even get through to their own parents when they're actually there watching in Ukraine what is going yeah, on. Right. right. With, with civilians being targeted and all this other kind of stuff that's going on. And their parents tell them they're liars, their own children. Yeah. You should really watch this, the latest Adam Curtis documentary called Trauma Zone, uh, which, you know, is really about, it's about Russia, oh, the fall of the Soviet Union and Russia in the 90s. Okay. And when the Chechnyan War, the first Chechnyan War was going on, uh, there was no state media, there was no state control media. And much like here, much like Vietnam, uh, but really rather much closer to home. All the mistakes and how it was bungled, the first Chechen war, all to hell. And that was being reported. And I really feel like, you know, that that's part of what the state media now has so much firm control that now they, you know, Ukraine has been bungled all to hell by the Russians. They don't want to have that happen again. So the propaganda is so powerful that the people just believe, they believe that they're, you know, things are okay. They don't want to they don't want to face the real reality the, the best i can interpret what our leadership decided with this whole ukraine thing on how to do it because you know they've gotten a lot of tomatoes thrown at them because we didn't send our top of the line equipment to ukraine and other stuff that you know like long-range weapons and stuff well because we've had to beat this whole thing of just like not having a direct confrontation with another nuclear power well and that's you know and then the quite well i mean look let me finish where I'm going with this. Um, the that will still be debatable on whether Russia would actually respond that way or they're just bluffing. But what what I think they were trying to do was that the best way to do that without the escalation that you're referring to, Adam, where it would escalate and uh, get out of hand, was that if you slowly, slowly wear down the Russian army, sort of the Vietnamization of the conflict now that's not easy on the ukrainian people okay i wish they had if they had been under the cover of nato see he won't move against nato because that shows strength and he's afraid of strength he goes on somebody who's not nato but this vietnamization along with it takes a long long time to get sanctions to work because you have well you have a lot of corruption takes a lot of time in the field and so the idea was to slowly starve out the economy where basically they lost the economic will and the special parts and things to continue to support an army and they just had to give up because they had nothing left to send so the it, you know and i can see that that's a possibility maybe that's a non-escalatory way it certainly is gruesome and how it draws out, but that maybe is the only way to slowly meter them out, you know, death by a thousand cuts. Now, the problem is, well, we're definitely fighting a proxy war. That's for sure. Yeah. The problem is, is that now they're starting, you know, they're running out of their own goods. 
I mean, you know, they I, I looked it up. If if you can believe the data on how many tanks are getting up to three thousand tanks lost, okay, if, if that's accurate, that's close to around what they lost in Stalingrad. You know, plus all of their top line troops are dead. Close to who lost in Stalingrad? The the, the, Russians? the Russians. They still won Stalingrad though. Yeah, but what I'm talking about is the scale. I mean, Stalingrad is always your top level of just widespread atrocity. I yeah, mean, it was a massive, class by itself. Pretty massive battle, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just total. I mean, a million laws on both sides. But something on that scale of widespread ass out, you know, operating assets have been lost in Ukraine already. Um, but the problem is now is that the only friends they have anymore are like the Iranians and the North Koreans, but they've got a lot of weapons. Now, I don't know if Russia has enough money to pay for all that stuff, or are they making other promises to Iran and North Korea where they don't have the money, but they have other things they can offer them in exchange for this? I mean, can you imagine how much stuff North Korea has? That's that's the biggest danger I see in this going on for forever is that you may not just be exhausting even the Russian stockpile, but you may have to go through the North Korean and Iranian at yeah. the same time. Right. And, you know, in an ironic sense, maybe that's not so bad either. Maybe, maybe it's it's a big maybe, black hole to drain these guys. Of, and the, the Iranians definitely have their problems. Right. Right. And they're and they're limited on what they can do and, and yeah. can't do, too. So um, that's I mean, this is what you call an attrition war. And supposedly a lot of the the stuff on the um, sanctions are just now starting to really start to hit the average consumer in Russia. Of course, you know, it was a good thing when all the Western companies started pulling out of Russia. That's the one thing, because I'm sure you guys know this, probably most of the listeners, when they did the mobilization, they don't generally get people from St. Petersburg and Moscow. They get them from the backwoods parts of Russia that nobody notices or cares about. All of those outlying republics and other places, you know, because they're racist in their own way. And so they send those people to the meat grinder. And so there's a lot of insulation in, in Moscow and St. Petersburg. It's more entertainment for them. But when they suddenly can't buy any goods anymore and things start really impacting them, that's why I don't know if you follow this much on Twitter, but man, there has been a rash. You know, we talked at the beginning about our power systems getting hit. I mean, there are major, major buildings getting hit in Russia. With explosions and fire, and you probably saw that mall in Moscow. Yeah, right. I think that's the biggest shopping place in Moscow, and it was a massive explosion. They the same day they had the main tire factory that provides all the tires for the military and the rest of Russia. It went up in flames. Now what they did, you know, the uh, they hit those two bases that were about as far away from Ukraine as Moscow is just south of there, those bases, they, they didn't say anything about who was involved, but now I think they figured out it was an old 1980s era Soviet reconnaissance drone. And these things are ancient looking. They use a little turbojet engine on them. You know, they, they look very Cold War-ish. Well, evidently, they had been able to put GPS. They don't have much manufacturing ability right now in Ukraine. They didn't have it before the war, and they have less now. But what they did was they were able to put GPS on them. They have a range, but they had no way to be controlled. But the clever thing, if this data is right that they did, was, you know, there's a lot of downed Russian airplanes across Ukraine that weren't totally obliterated. Evidently, they took transponders off of those Russian airplanes and installed them on these these UAVs. So when they went in through the missile defense, the Russians thought it was a Russian airplane. Oh my God. They recognized it as a, now that's pretty clever. That is clever. So they yeah. were Russian air. They thought they were Russian airplanes on their radar well, and came and hit. So what nobody knows is they have a whole lot of those. One thing too, with the, with the Ukrainians is just like, you know, you can't really, 
that a lot of them speak Russian. So, I mean, they could be sneaking over and pretending to be Russian and go into these places and just blow stuff up. I mean, you know. And I mean, you'll you never know. hear those people yeah. if they got caught or if they blew themselves up in the process, all sorts of things. Now, he, here's the irony of it. Now, I just didn't think about this to now. I mean, that's what, kind of what happens when you invade your neighbor. I mean, it's kind of and, – and they look just like you. Right, right. Well, I mean, you know, you know how weird it was at the beginning of the war. Like I've I've seen the footage of the Russian tank ran out of gas, and it's sitting there on the side of the road, and you know this guy's in his little wood paneled station wagon. You know, Ukrainian drives by. I mean, they're just driving by the Russian army and making fun of them. You know, saying, "Well, hey, we'll, we'll hook up your tank and we'll tow you back to Russia if you want." And they're just like sort of joking darkly between the two. It's a weird thing, but what I was going to say is if you assume that these special forces or guys are going deep into Russia and doing additional bombings or things like this, um, they may be taking themselves out so they don't get caught. You know, um, we would look at those as heroic figures because they're really risking their lives. But then you start wondering, where does the line blur between that and the suicide bombers that we see? from palestine one man's freedom fighters another's terrorist exactly i know you guys understand that and that's that's heavy something to chew on is that according to what chair you're sitting in the time someone's a terrorist or they're like say a freedom fighter you, you, you remember when bill maher got in big trouble when he talked about those guys who took over the planes on 911 and said they must have been really brave to do that i mean that almost ended his career you know, mm -hmm. for saying something like mm -hmm. that. But it, it, it's food for thought I mean, when you look at other parts of the world and you see that stuff. I mean, th that's what desperate people have to do when they don't have any kind of balance of power, you know, of weaponry, whatever, they're going to resort to that. But as far as predictions internationally, when I watch Twitter and I watch those, I don't know how many of them are naturally caused or exaggerated. But I would keep an eye on that is how much more that you're going to see in Russia. Now, yeah. just the, now that, that stuff that's like where it's lit up and, you know, vandalism and arson and stuff like that. As far as those missiles, the United States this week officially announced that they were not going to intervene to stop Ukraine from using their own weaponry for those deep strikes. That was a big, big thing. And now they're sending Patriots. I'm sure you probably heard that too. Right. That's, pa the, new, that's the latest thing. Yeah. Right. And that, that, that started the saber rattling about the nukes again from Putin. He keeps drawing those red lines, you know, but, um, they, they said basically, if, you know, if you want to use your own, just don't use our stuff to go there, but we can't stop you from using your own stuff. So what they don't know is how many of those, old weapons they have but they said they have a lot so i think you're probably going to see a whole lot of that in the months ahead a lot of just things catching on fire and exploding in russia yeah let's uh let's switch gears for a little bit um well the time that we have left we need to hit this mike because i really think this is something that should concern everyone and i know that it, it should concern you is um from from Skywatch TV, uh, how Obama, Hitler, and the throne of Satan are connected to the mystery of Jesus. Oh yeah. Uh, so this says Obama visited the great altar of Zeus, what the Bible calls the seal, uh, so it calls the seat or throne of Satan, while in Berlin, which is especially important given what he did on returning to the United States. Approximately 2,000 years after Revelation 2.13 was written, German archaeologists removed the massive altar of Zeus from the ruins of Pergamos and took it to Berlin, where it was restored as the centerpiece of the Pergamon Museum. It is here that Hitler first adored it, later building an outdoor replica of it from which he gave a series of speeches that mesmerized many Germans. After Obama received inspiration from the throne of Satan while in Berlin, what he did next was astonishing. Upon returning to the United States, he immediately commissioned the construction of a Greek column stage from which he made his acceptance speech for his party's nomination. 
Because Greek temples such as those built to honor Zeus were thought to house the patron deity, the GOP ridiculed Obama, mocking him as playing Zeus at Mount Olympus and accusing his supporters of kneeling before the temple of Obama. I, I just want your thoughts, Mike, because you know, like I'm, I, I've been since I read that, I've been losing sleep. Well, I don't even know why you bother me having on the show to get my forecast of what's really going to go on in the future, because you got access to those people. And obviously they've got a better pulse on the stuff that really right, matters. Right. Right. To people like you and me, right. and you know, their insights that this is something that would have happened in 2008, by the way. Yes. Yes. At, right. at the time. Yeah. And you know, when these things were done, they said, well, look, this is the beginning of the end. This is, this is bringing down everything as we know it. And um, we now know how during the regime of Barack Obama, everything that we know in life was over and extinguished. That was just so incredibly apocalyptic that life as we never experienced before all radically changed. You know, I mean, it's just like what you read in the last days in the book of Revelation that all basically happened. And now we're in this post-apocalyptic society because of that eight years you know yeah i mean he did all of those incredible you know humanity altering things like playing a lot of golf you know keeping his pants what? zip zipped up you know well i mean being, you know being faithful I mean, to his wife but what about the what about the you know what about the lapel pin scandal don't you remember that don't you or the like you know when he wore like the different colored suit my god yes. i mean I just the he had the shit shook. thing and and well there was the other thing they did to the queen you remember when they gave him uh the queen a big of england a big stack of uh dvds what that was the <laughs> that was the formal gift when they met her was a stack of dvds um i mean you know it's horrific i mean it's like how could humanity continue it's, it's like nostradamus must have said something about you know a lot of this and Clearly, really, you know, why, why should they even worry about bringing all of this, uh, obviously incredibly important things to us when they've already gone on the record that the world is going to end in 2025 when apophis comes and swings past. True. America. True. Doesn't that make a lot of this stuff moot at that yeah. point? I mean, well, they shouldn't even be worried if the Democrats take over unless they turn all of our children to drag queens between now and 2025. Well, that headline just gets your attention. It, yeah, I, mean, I got we, my we, attention. We equated Obama and Hitler and Satan basically as the same person. But uh, we, we, you and, know. and what you expect to hear in that story is convincing proof that right. they're all one and the same. Well, okay, so some other you know articles here that you know are going to keep me up at night. Uh, Pastor says stage is being set for cashless six 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 system. Federal Reserve major banks launch digital dollar. Uh, you know, Zeitgeist twenty twenty five is coming, and Visa begins testing book of Revelation like dystopian pay by head and hand tech. Uh, dangerous, demonic, and entirely unbiblical. A deep dive into the enneagram. What's wrong uh, with the Negro? G20 leaders agree to global vaccination passport system. Where will it 666 end? Noah, the flood, the tower, and the battle for Western civilization. Uh, is serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer in heaven? <laughs> Young evangelicals turning back on Repu backs on Republicans. I mean, the world is falling apart. Well, and again, they've got a pulse on all this. And you remember when I said earlier about how people don't remember something that got them worked up a week ago. Yeah. Groups like this, like you're just talking about, absolutely rely on that to be able to sell new stuff every week. Yeah. Who remembers what the crisis was last week? What was going to end it all for us last week? Now it's this this week. How, how many days of the Lord's return have we been presented with that were like sure fire going to happen? You know, they've moved, they've moved it out to 2025, which takes a little bit more time to sell some stuff. But I don't you remember, um, wasn't there 2012? Wasn't that the big one they sold the books on? Yeah. 
was in it, and then there was like Zenith 2016 or something like that. Mm-hmm. In fact, I think I have a copy of Zenith 2016. Yeah, the people who buy that stuff, you ask them next year. I mean, the true believers, they buy them the next year. You ask them about, well, I thought, I thought now you're buying the next one for 2025. Didn't they say 2016? And they look at you with a glassy stare of cognitive dissonance. Because, you know, in that religious culture, there are people making prophecies all the time. Almost never do they come true. And those same people keep going back and getting new prophecies for the same person. You know, a lot of these most popular ones were they all the ones who prophesied for sure that uh, Trump was going to win the second term, that it had been decreed in heaven. At least one or two of them had the decency to say, gee, I did that in the flesh. That was me. That wasn't God talking. You know, but the other ones, they just doubled down. And it's like, move along. You didn't see anything. Tell me what you believe well, now. And, you know, I don't like, mean just mean to pick on be, religious right. There's people that's because the Satan paranormal stole the, stuff did the Satan, same thing. Satan stole the election. Yeah. So in heaven, I know some of them said in heaven, he did win the thing, you know, but it's yeah. just not reflected on earth. And then you remember he was going to get inaugurated in March of that year because America had become a corporation. Oh, yeah. The corporation in March, it was supposed to be. But. It, it, you know, like I said, I didn't. I don't want to just pick on the religious right, who I normally pick on. I'm sure you all have seen that in the paranormal community too, in UFO community. Oh yeah, absolutely. People make all sorts of claims and stuff, and nobody holds them remotely accountable. Absolutely, yeah. Because it's it's entertainment more than new. Disclosure is always coming. Oh, you know, round the corner. Yep. Yeah. And again, for people, whether they admit it to themselves or not, they're going this not because. There's a good reason to believe this is real news happening. It's because it's entertainment. And there's nothing wrong with entertainment as long as you recognize that as such. You know, um, Rush Limbaugh always admitted that what he did was entertainment. It sounded a lot like news, what he covered. But he always, you know, he just had a, you know, wink of the eye, you know, jaundiced eye toward it and just said, no, this is entertainment. I do. Which is really smart he did that, too, because that protected him from a lot of lawsuits of things that he said. Now, Alex Jones has had to back into that position. Right. You know, Alex Jones finally admitted it that, you know, this is you're not to take this, including Sandy Hook, is like that. I really meant that, that I really meant that for real. And do his followers care that he confesses to that? That it was meant as an entertainment venue? They don't seem to care. You know, well, I guess their integrity is not a requirement. I guess they're effectively entertained. I suppose. Yeah. So, Doctor Future, you're getting back into the entertainment game. Yeah. Speaking of fraudulent media figures, <laughs> no, no wonder I triggered your mind from that. Um, yeah. You know, the Bible that talks about the dog returning to its own vomit. Well, I, I guess that's probably what I'm going to be doing. Um, <laughs> When I did Future Quake before, you know, for seven years, and I, I'm amazed you all have been on for, what, coming up on your 11th year or something like that? Yeah, in something March insane. it'll be 11 years. Well, yeah, for something me. insane. Adam, yeah. Yeah. But in the seven years that I did that, I felt like it got to be a treadmill. Like, why am I doing this? I always had this deadline. You all know what I'm talking about. Deadline every week. Of course, it was like a one-man operation as far as putting it together for me. So... You know, I, I did the technical part half-heartedly, and I did the, you know, content half-heartedly. Um, so I thought, well, you know, I just, I'll sit down and write my books, and people will want to read them, and, you know, I'll work at my own pace. Well, you know, you can lead a horse to water. And it's been a disheartening but eye-opening experience the last two and a half years of, taking what I think is some of my best work and going around to a group of people who I think should care about it and, and mostly like practicing Christian people, but others too, uh, or people who have family members who are, uh, and have found very, very little, very small amount of response where people actually think it's as significant. The findings is what I do. Um, 
And so it's been very disheartening. Uh, people who should care like theology professors or political science or whatever, I don't even get responses back from people to information I provide. Um, people who sort of celebrity in some of these worlds, you know, I've sent them stuff, nothing. So thinking that I, you know, the hand of God is providence is directing what I'm doing or some, hopefully some influence, I have to learn from it and I have to sort of see, well, what other options are available to get the word out? It's no good writing tons of books, no matter how good or not good they are, if nobody knows about it or very few people. And so I've sort of gotten to a position right now is that um, a radio station like Radio Free Nashville is a way at least to reach a city. It's a unique opportunity because there are tons and tons and tons of podcasts out there. And the top ones have a big following. But it's sort of unique to be able to have an airwaves connection. Now, the question is how many people listen on radio anymore. And I don't know the answer to that, but what I've decided is that I'm just going to have to take it to the streets. This is where I'm going with this. You know, there aren't enough shows out there anymore that want to talk about these subjects that you, you know, I don't want to wear you all out and come out forever. You got a lot of other stuff to talk about, but uh, there's just an item for me to go be a guest on there, which would be a lot more efficient way for me to write and research and get the word out. And so I'm going to have to go back and just grab the bull by the horns and put something together, even if it's just sort of focused on this limited subject matter that I focus on now. And so <clears throat> I was already leaning that direction. And then out of the blue, the program manager of Radio Free Nashville, uh, I took her a copy of my book because she was one of the two endorsements on the back of the book. So we'd had a long, long overdue um, lunch this fall. And out of the blue, she says, why don't you come back on Radio Free Nashville? And I had already just toyed with the idea in the back of my mind. But then I thought, gee, that's uh, that's just more work and more. You know, I have a hard enough time trying to get these books formatted and done to, to meet all the different platforms that I release it on. My hands were full with that. And I thought, I don't want to grab into all that. But I started feeling an air of inevitability. If I was going to stay somewhat relevant in the audience, I was going to have to do something myself. Yeah. And so um, with trepidation, I said, okay. And a couple of things I asked for, which, which they could work with and accommodate, was that my preference was to go on during the drive time. Because when I was uh, on WENO after the Radio Free Natural phase of Future Quake, we were on the last half hour before the station shut down every day at 4 to 4.30. Well, it was amazed over time. It took a while. How many commuters that were just out of boredom were flipping the dial and bumped into it. And it was just serendipitous. And so um, I would like to at least create an environment where if somebody is stuck in downtown Nashville traffic, that they can be flipping the dial out of boredom and hear something strange and stick around. And that's not, that's not going to be much of anybody, you know, anytime over a short haul. There's no way to draw enough data. It didn't take a while because I'm not even sure exactly, you know, I'm going to be fluid in how I do this. But bottom line is I'm going to going to be on every Thursday from 5 to 6 p.m. Central on Radio Free Nashville. And it's going to be called the Two Spies Report because it's going to have a narrower focus than Future Quake did. Uh, it's going to focus on the the spiritual aspects of things going on in the world, both current event stuff and going back in history. Just the same stuff that you know that I do already. Right. But it's going to be a lot of people who probably never heard of it. A much smaller group of people, they're going to care to listen the second time. But I'm just hoping there's a bunch of bored people out there. That's my cross my fingers. And they're they're just stuck downtown. What, one big change with Radio Free Nashville for an, I mean, it's been 15 years since I've been on there, believe it or not. 15 years. When I was on back then, it's a low power FM station. So their signal could barely go past their parking lot. I mean, it was out on the far eastern, up on a mountain, a Loveless Cafe. They had very limited reach where they could reach. Well, since I've been there, they worked out something with a transponder on 103.7 FM 
that sends their signal through all of greater Nashville. Like, even like lingering up in a little bit of Goodlettsville. So that's a big game changer in terms of at least potential reach on a show like that. So uh, I'm curious to see if that makes any difference. Um, the BNO reached multiple states, but it was on the AM dial. People, you know, listen to AM for news and older people do. But I read an article yesterday that said that electric vehicles are starting to drop the AM band from their radios because it gets so much interference with electric vehicles. Oh, really? I don't know if you ever heard of that, but I thought that was fascinating. And so they're just having FM radios. And I remember the days of FM, they used to have FM only radios. They put in cars sometimes, but um, so I don't know if that's going to be significant down the road or not. So what I'm going to do, it's going to be more than the radio show. If I can pull it off. Because the last couple of months, I've been just mired in the most soul-robbing effort of learning software and trying to learn how to do all this stuff, this old guy trying to do it. I'm going to also try to start a YouTube channel, also called the Two Spies Report. In fact, I think there's a placeholder there already. And what I'm going to do is try to simultaneously record a video um, show and then use the audio for the radio show. But... The way the show is going to be structured, I'm not going to really do a lot of guests. It's going to be a rare occasion when I have a guest. Mostly I'm going to rattle on about my stuff. And because I know people get really bored hearing it, I'm going to break it up into 17-minute seg segments or so and then dust off my old music for meditation. Um, I may have been the only person that ever enjoyed doing that, but it was something that I had the privilege of being able to do on Radio Free Nashville where I could play some old weird songs that related to what we were talking about. And I think people are going to need the mental break instead of hearing me drone on. And so they can get me in little bite-sized pieces and then have a strange song. And then we get back to our discussion. And the last segment, I'll probably start trying to talk about some contemporary issues in the news. So it would be just being little drinks. But on the YouTube channel, my thinking right now is to take each of those three segments and make those independent videos because um, people with attention spans these days, I'm probably asking a lot to get them to watch 17 minutes of a video. Mm -hmm. So it's, they can get a little bite size. I don't serialize it. Yeah. And, and so you, most of the time you're not going to be doing it live. Yeah. But I think you said like once a month, you will be. That's, that's sort of my reasoning. They, it used to be at Radio Free Nashville, they really wanted you to do it most all the time in station, if you could. Somehow that tied into the local flavor of what they did. And, you know, they got a studio. It's modest, but a real studio. And so they backed off that a lot. People do a lot more because of COVID and things. They do remote. But, you know, they still like to have that connection. And so one of the unique things about the show is... Uh, you know, now the internet is sort of caught up with streaming and, you know, y'all done stream yard and those kind of things, uh, where, you, where you have people send in messages. You can do an old fashioned live show there where you take calls. And, um, we did that a little bit on future quake back in the day. Mostly they were wrong numbers that would call to the station, but I would still get them to talk about the subject anyway, even though they called the wrong number. I remember one person called for a pizza. Uh, and so I kept them on the line and asked them about what we were talking about. So I don't know how long it'll take to build up people who might actually call in, but once a month, I thought would be reasonable because it, 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 it requires its own different set of preparation on my behalf for a live show. But I think, and, and it's out in Timbuktu from where I live, but, um, you know, certainly would like to have some, some friends join me in studio for that. I think it'd be a lot of fun. Yeah. You might hear a familiar voice on there. Uh oh, that would be, that would be like really awesome. The only thing is it would probably push me to the margins. You know, they, they would probably, the audience would gravitate to my friends. Oh yeah. I don't know. What to well, do. I do want to point out that, uh, you were going to follow, um, hold the funk, yeah. which, you know what, that was one of the other original shows that started radio free national in 2005. Because really? I worked on the station with the guy that does Hold the Funk. And uh, 
um, myself and Mrs. Future, you know, we, we actually put the vinyl siding on the side of that station, but, but he, he goes all the way back. You think about that's a long time. That's 18 years ago. Hold the funk spin on the air and everybody volunteers there. Nobody gets paid. You know, there's no, um, at least people don't have to worry about my corruption that I'm taking money and getting money under the table from sponsors and, you know, giving them a pass because there's none of that going on. Uh, this is just, I care about people. I care and love people. And in my only weird way, I want to be able to pass on some information, food for thought, if anything, to liberate them. And this is something that will come up eventually. You know, some of my more hardcore spiritual stuff will just be on the YouTube channel. I'm, you know, it's a secular station. I got to be a little careful in what I do, but it's going to be still spiritual oriented with a lot of historical information and, and hard, hard data, like the kind of stuff you find in my blog, the two spies report. But, you know, the direction I'm going in my life right now, spiritually, I've, my eyes have been wide open the last couple of years and it's going to be in a new book I have out. There's hopefully it's going to be my magnum opus. And what I've been able to discover in my studies of scripture and things like that is that the, the true spiritual path to God, his message to humanity is one of liberation, deliverance and emancipation. And if, if that doesn't come through and anything you're considering about, about interactions with God, then you're listening wrong. You you heard something wrong. If it didn't involve liberation, emancipation and deliverance. And now that I see my eyes have come open on this, I suddenly things are starting to make sense to me. And the implication of, well, you know, most of you, I know a lot of your, folks in your audience have grown up in traditional religion, you know, and they always heard about this angry God up in heaven that was so angry even before they were born. And they had to do all crawling, crushed glass and do all these things to try to assuage his anger. And Jesus had to take his own life to make sure he wouldn't be angry anymore. And a lot of that thinking I had did not realize growing up that they were innovations that came on like a thousand years after the church was founded. And so this has opened up a whole new venue for me to understand that is actually much clearer right now. And so that's going to obviously make its way into the thinking of my writing in this show is that the message of the path that our creators taken us all is to greater liberation, deliverance and emancipation from our enemies. Some of them are spiritual enemies. Some of them are just ourselves what we do to our, we're our own worst enemies half the time. So um, how I look at current events, how I look at history, you know, that's going to percolate too, I'm sure up through that. So it's going to be on once a month, once a week, five o'clock. Mm -hmm. If you want to hear it live, it'll be streamed at radiofreenashville.org. Um, since it's going to be sort of episodic where, you know, the narrative is going to continue from one week to the next, probably very slowly. Um, they'll, you know, there'll be a version of them that'll be archived at the YouTube channel, the two spies report. And, um, uh, are we'll sort gonna, of see what goes from there, but it's starting it January 5th. Cool. Perfect. Are you going to put it out on his podcast feed as well? Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. And in fact, I could probably use some major advice from you guys on how right. to do that because the, uh, the YouTube version of the show re connected back into like an hour show is probably how I'm going to do the podcast because uh, they have a license at the station for some of the music I'll play. And um, our friend, Joel, uh, friend of your show too, had written a special theme music for this that will be nice. used on the YouTube show and also cool. for the podcast. So yeah. I don't even know if he knows that maybe I'm surprising him on this episode, but um, he probably gave up on me and thought he's never going to use that. And we, we had some false starts, uh, that was nobody's fault, but false starts on doing this, but now is the time to do it. And so, um, so it'll be some different iterations, but there'll be a lot of internet only exclusive segments on the YouTube channel that won't be on the radio station too. So, but just bear with me. I'm learning this all from scratch. I was starting to learn audacity right when this interview started, I was 
trying to tweak that. This is going to have a new theme song and new closing music on the Radio Free Nashville show that I think people are going to get a hoot out of. So, but, we'll, but we'll find out. Excellent, guys. Yeah, tune in January 5th. Uh, so on the on the terrestrial radio here in Nashville, but also YouTube and podcasts as well. So yeah, so, people, 5 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Central every Thursday, starting January 5th. Uh, you can stream it at RadioFreeNashville.org if you're not in Nashville. 103.7 FM has the biggest reach within metropolitan Nashville if you're here. And then the YouTube channel will archive all these kind of shows where you can, and you'll actually see my ugly mug on there. And I've not done anything like that. So I don't know how weird I'm going to look on camera. So um, just, just bear with me. It's not going to be a lot of fancy graphics and other stuff. And, you know, how far out do you think the first broadcasts of future quake are out into the universe by now, since they are terrestrial waves that <laughs> That's a indefinitely. good question. You know, I, I was able to get, some of the images of Dr. Future on those golden plates on Pioneer 10. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I don't know. It's so if we have any any astronomers or amateur astronomers or astrophysicists who know how to calculate that math, it'd be cool to, it'd be cool to see. Zeta reticuli. You know, something that might benefit us as, as a civilization regarding Future Quake is that if an outer hostile power hears Future Quake, <laughs> they'll suddenly realize that we are so backward and have lack of development that they probably won't see us as a threat to eliminate. They'll just they'll just leave us alone. Yeah, they'll see. Well, those guys are, are many, many hundreds of millions of years behind being a threat to us. So, well. All right, Dr. Future. Well, on that note, that's a good place to end the show. Where can people find you, uh, find your web presence? Well, if they want to find me personally, I have these like four square feet of this chair. I never leave in the house. Yeah. And you would think I would get a lot more stuff done for all the time I spend here going through reports and data. But if you want to find me online, a um, couple places, my blog which I haven't done a, a new post in a long time. I've got probably about 30 draft ones I still need to put up. It's at, at uh, twospiesreport.wordpress.com. And I'll, I'll have to remember to put an announcement about the show up there here, sir, too. So twospiesreport.wordpress.com. That will be a source of information I will talk about on the show, too, as well as my book stuff and things. Um, the websites, if you go to mikebennettbooks.com, or akribospress.com, the publisher, A-K-R-I-B-O-S.com, um, akribospress.com. Both of those have a place where you can send me a message if you want to, if you want to contact me for whatever reason. But I'll try to update those with announcements. I don't know what I'm getting into. I hope I can keep this stuff up. But um, you all have done such a fantastic job all these years. I mean, you all have been the standard bearer. You know, one place I feel comfortable coming on. Well, we thank you for that. We thank you for that, Dr. Future. When your listeners have been so, they put up with Grandpa here in the chair. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's like, be nice to Grandpa in the corner. He'll go to sleep eventually. And they, they've been very kind. We'll, we'll make sure you will get your bib on. and Uh-huh. Yeah, if I start drooling. <laughs> All right, Dr. Feature, excellent. Uh, thank you so much for coming on and always doing this with us at the end of the year. It's, it's been our tradition now for several years. And uh, guys, we're going to be back next week with the uh, our little you know year in review show, talk about what we talked about through the year, which is also our tradition. And mm -hmm. uh, guys, you can find us, uh, conspiranormal.com. There is a Conspiranormal YouTube channel as well. And there, of course, is all of our strange realities presence. But if you want to help the show, you can go to Patreon and Sergio can tell you where to find that. You can find that at patreon.com slash conspiranormal. Which, by the way, I should add that our latest Patreon episode is a Patreon episode that Surfiel did on uh, the Farms Patreon, which uh, Steven Snyder has allowed us to put on there. So if you guys go listen to that, you get to hear Surfiel on another uh, on another podcast, and it's a really interesting topic. So check that out. But uh, all right, guys, well, we will be back to formally end the year, 2022. 
next week on Conspiranormal.